Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Toronto Mississauga's webinar entitled Living Green, How to Make a Difference in Your Everyday Life. I'm Morgan Wong, 2018 graduate of the Master of Science in Sustainability Management program at UTM. I currently work as a policy analyst at Natural Resource Canada, providing evidence-based policy advice to advance clean tech innovation across the country. Today's webinar has visitors attending from across Canada and around the world. We have folks watching from India, Lima, California, Seattle, Caro, Madrid, Paris, and of course, all around the GTA. So welcome to you all. Today's webinar will take a look, a personal look at the effects that we as individuals have on the environment and discuss some of the things that we can do to lessen our impact upon it. It will give us a chance to think more closely about our relationships with our homes and the world that we share. I'm so excited to be here today to help moderate the Q&A and more importantly, introduce today's speaker and my good friend from UTM's MSCSM program, Swin Swinzel Chakan. Hi Swinzel. Hey Morgan, how's it going? Good, good. So Swinzel began her career working on zero waste initiatives at the University of British Columbia's sustainability office. She then moved on to work in water conservation at the Sunshine Coast Regional District before attending UTM's MSCSM program, which she graduated from in 2018. After working on Scotiabank's sustainable business team for almost two years, Swinzel joined the City of Toronto and now works on projects related to transportation innovation, heat relief for vulnerable residents, and responsive child care for families in Toronto. Following Swinzel's presentation, there'll be a moderated Q&A with the audience. We just ask that you hold off on submitting your questions until after Swinzel's presentation is finished as she may be addressing your questions during the talk. So now without further ado, I'm gonna turn off my camera and we can get started with today's presentation. Over to you, Swinzel. Thanks, Morgan. Um, and I am going to start sharing my screen. Here we go. Oh, and Let's just go back one. All right. Um, yeah, thanks everyone so much for joining today. Um, I was really excited to do this. Um, it's obviously a really huge topic, um, but I'm glad everyone joined. And I think the intention of today is to provide little snippets here and there of things we can do and also look at how it all fits into a broader context of sustainability. Um, and so I called it living sustainably uh, in a pandemic with a question mark. And that's there because um, just recognizing the context of the world we're in. And there's a lot of things we could do, but uh, it's important to also just be kind to ourselves. And, um, you know, if there's just one thing you can take away today, um, that's probably enough. Um, and related to that, um, before we start, um, I did want to um, just again acknowledge where we are today. You know, um, it's been a really hard 13, coming on 14 months. Uh, since we've been in a lockdown in Toronto, at least, and maybe more or less in other places. Um, and it's not just been COVID, you know, we've seen the stark realities of racism and racial injustice in Toronto and beyond um, against the Asian community and the Black community. Uh, we've been on probably too many Zoom calls. So again, thank you for joining today. Um, and it's been one of the only ways to stay in touch a lot of the time with um, people that we love. Um, and we've been holed up in our homes a lot, you know, and a lot of people have been alone in their homes a lot. And so we've gained an intimate knowledge of our homes and how much energy we actually really use during the day that previously our employers uh, might have been paying for. Um, we also know, um, you know, the pandemics in different phases all over the world. It's uh, we're getting we're lucky to get vaccines here. Uh, in Toronto and they're slowly coming around and in Canada and in the United States, um, but there's other parts of the world. Um, you know, we know what's happening in India right now and 
I guess I just want to say, you know, I hope your friends and your families are safe and that you're getting both the physical and medical supports you need, but also um, some of the mental supports you need to cope with this. Um, but we've also seen, you know, great things. We've seen friends helping each other, neighbors helping each other, um, and a lot of solidarity. And so I didn't want to jump into my presentation without acknowledging these things because it is a little bit strange to be talking about um, how to be sustainable in our own lives when there's a raging pandemic um, going on outside. And um, so again, yeah, just be kind to yourself. And if you just take away one thing today, I think um, that's that's more um, than, than anything else you could do. Um, and so I guess the question is, uh, what is it to live more sustainable, sustainably and why do we need to change your habits? You know, um, in the wise world, words of Michael Scott, you know, too much change is not a good thing, ask the climate. Um, and essentially some of these changes we wanna make is exactly for that reason. Um, I also, um, you'll notice that I, have been using the word sustainable a lot. And for my MSCSM friends on this call, you'll know exactly why. Um, for the rest of the people on this call, um, I just wanted to take a moment to broaden the definition of green to sustainable. Um, and that, sh that shift is really thinking about changing from, you know, how do we save the planet? How do we recycle and reuse? And um, how do we support the environment um, and forests? And really thinking more broadly about how do we create livable, sustainable communities um, and broaden the concept of the different types of sustainability that exist and how they're all really inextricably linked. Um, and if any of you, again, are from MSCSM on this call, um, you will know in the wise words of Shashi that um, sustainability is love. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, and, um, and I think uh, that's a really good way to define it. Um, so you'll see me talk a little bit more about what we normally refer to as sustainability, and then also a little bit uh, more about some of those broader uh, sustainability themes. So um, moving on to the next slide. So let's start with the basics. And these are things you've heard before and I didn't wanna to spend tons and tons of time talking about them because there are things I think most people on this call know and a quick Google search would probably tell you. But I would be remiss not to mention them because this is a talk about living sustainably. So let's start with waste. Um, I have a really good friend who uh, told me that waste was the gateway drug to the rest of sustainability. And, uh, and I think recycling is the gateway to waste. So um, the basics, you know, reduce and then reuse and then recycle. And related to that is composting, you know, separate your organics uh, if you're in the part of the world where you're able to. Um, otherwise it goes to landfills, anaerobically digests, creates lots of methane. And that's obviously uh, a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, and then also share, you know, where you can. Um, there's a lot of things going on in the sharing economy nowadays. And so I wanted to also add things maybe you haven't heard about related to that. So um, again, recycling, everyone's really interested in this. And I looked at some of the questions that came in uh, when you registered for this chat. And there's a lot of questions about recycling because it is really exciting and it is something we deal with a lot. Um, and I think the most important tip I would have for recycling is check your local recycling and organics, not just recycling guides, because there are so many products out there that have a recycling, the little triangle label on it, or say they're compostable, but they're, they might not be in your particular municipality or region. And so it's really important to check that. And the city of Toronto has a great waste wizard tool. Uh, Peel region has a lot of great resources. So um, yeah, check out what's happening in your locality. Um, so that you don't wishfully recycle, because sometimes wishful recycling is worse um, than accidentally not recycling, because you might contaminate a big bag of things that are actually recyclable, and it's too much work to sort, and you might accidentally send a bunch of recyclables to the landfill. Um, related to that is reusables. Obviously, look for things that aren't single use. Um, there was a question that came in uh, when uh, people were registering around, what can I do in my kitchen or my laundry room? Um, I have a giant stack of tea towels or wash towels um, instead of um, kitchen roll. And, um, and you can just, you know, do a quick wipe, throw them in the washing machine. Um, use dryer balls. So don't 
use the dryer at all, you know, try and hang dry your clothes whenever you can, although uh, we're a little strapped for time. Um, so, you know, wherever you can do something like that. The sharing economy is something I'm very excited about and we're seeing more and more examples of it. There are tool libraries where you can rent, you know, like a drill or a saw or whatever you might need that you don't want to have in your home all the time. Um, so there's a lot of um, good local options for tool libraries. Um, also clothing rental. Um, it's great. Uh, you don't have to buy clothes once and then if you don't want it, uh, you don't have to do something with it, you can just return it or, um, you know, buy clothes that you'll only ever wear once um, and then and then return those and, and then uh, share it with someone else. And it's a really cool model that um, if you're ever going to a fancy event worth trying out. Um, and then more generally, just thinking about the waste footprints of items that you use, you know, um, buying things made out of recycled components or buying things used is usually better than new things. Electronics in particular have a very high waste footprint. So um, think about these things. Also, when people get really excited about sustainability, the one thing I've seen is they go out and buy all these items that are real, that's gonna help them be more sustainable. But sometimes um, making do with what you have is better instead of um, creating, you know, throwing out old things and buying new things. Um, and then we'll move on to water. Uh, this one is near and dear to me because I used to work in water conservation um, and I'm very excited about it. And so the things you might have heard before are things like using aerators. So there are things you can add to your faucet that aerate your water, add more air to it. And so your pressure is maintained, but you're using less water. Uh, you know, obviously taking shorter showers, you know, shower with a friend, um, use high efficiency dishwashers and um, things like dual flush toilets. And then maybe the stuff that you haven't heard about as much or haven't thought about as much, but, and this one I'm really passionate about is um, learn about your local water supply. Um, it's really interesting when we think about where the resources we use actually come from. And sometimes they do tours. Sometimes um, they have really cool locations you can visit. Um, there's a, you know, there's cool places in Toronto that you can visit uh, when it comes to local water supply, like Ontario being one of them. Um, and then also the general water conserving changes that you might have heard about, heard about, you know, if you're a gardener, use things like drip irrigation, um, which uses far less water than a sprinkler system, um, you know, xeriscape, you know, plant, plant plants that don't need as much water as a, you know, as a big lawn, um, you know, use a bidet in your toilet. There's lots of really good options you can get nowadays. And Again, like with waste, think about a water foot, the water footprint of the products you use. You know, a lot of people um, have stopped using dairy milk and switched to non-dairy because it's much better in terms of emissions, and it is. It's vastly, vastly better. But um, sometimes you also end up with a problem of too much almond milk demand, and that has a huge water footprint. And I hope I'm not whizzing through these, but there's, there's more coming after these slides. Um, so the last two I wanted to talk about were energy and emissions, and they're very closely related. Um, but I, I've talked about them slightly separately because um, some of the energy use you do could be renewable, whereas emissions, I'm talking more just about um, how much um, carbon we're putting into the air. And so you've heard all of these things, you know, turn off your lights, switch to higher efficiency light bulbs, such as LEDs, turn off your ghost appliances that are plugged in when you're not using them and look for uh, high efficiency appliances, you know, things like Energy Star. Um, and with emissions, you know, eat locally, use solar, drive or fly less. This is one that I might be guilty of. Um, I have friends and family all over the world. I do fly, but um, and so I'm guilty uh, of um, creating a lot of emissions in this way. Um, buy less um, because everything you, everything you buy has a long waste and water and energy footprint associated with it that probably led to a lot of emissions. And then this last one, and my, uh, if I, any of my vegan friends are on the call, they like this, but go vegan. I have so far been thoroughly unsuccessful at doing this, but reducing um, meat does have a large impact. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later in this presentation. Um, and some of the interesting things. So um, do all of the above to reduce your energy and emissions. Everything is related to energy and emissions. 
Um, things have life cycle costs, things have long supply chains, you know, um, think about, you know, what was mined to create your phone and what, what the shipping emissions might've been and where you got it and what's going to happen at the end of its life, because you really want to upgrade to that new, that new phone. Um, and so just keeping those things in mind. Um, the other question that I had that came in before this presentation, when you registered was around, um, transportation and electric cars. So I'm a huge fan of active transportation. It creates complete streets. Um, you know, when you have uh, things like surface transit, such as buses or streetcars, um, you have subways, you have ways that people can bike around, you have good pedestrian paths. Those kinds of things make a really good city and really strong communities. Electric cars are good. A lot of people say that, oh, well, the batteries are really bad for the environment. And that's true, it does it's very resource intensive to make those. Um, electric cars are good. If you're in the market for a new car and you need a new car, hybrid is great. Electric is also great. Um, but a lot of people seem to think that electric cars are the solution to our future of the energy crisis. And I would caution against that because you're still producing cars. Cars take up a lot of parking space and that space is space that could potentially have been used for bike racks, pedestrians, parks, public parks um and you know things that make up a community um and then there's the problem of retrofitting everything retrofits are great you know seal up the windows and um you know get rid of the drafts that uh result in high energy bills but also it's expensive um and it's sometimes really resource intensive to do that so it's something to keep in mind and finally, there's so many helpful gadgets that help with all four of these um, things. And uh, just be mindful of how many you're buying, because again, they have a really long life cycle cost. But there are things that are really helpful. Um, there are, you know, thermostat controls that, um, you know, help you control your, your temperature remotely so that you, you're, you're saving more energy. Um, there's timed power bars. There are really cool types of light bulbs that you can buy. Um, there's dimmers. So there's a lot of gadgets, but just again, be mindful of how much you're buying. Um, so now that we've gotten over the, the stuff that people might have heard before, I wanted to move into two other areas of sustainability. Um, the first one that people often think of, so ecology and conservation, and what are some things that you can do um, to be more um, to support ecology and support conservation efforts. So this is not an exhaustive laundry list. Um, I'm also not an expert in all of these things. Um, and, but I pulled out a few interesting things that I think uh, touch many people's lives. So the first one um, is thinking about what you buy. So I've called out fish and shrimp there. So fisheries obviously has had a really huge impact on ocean biodiversity. Um, you know, a lot of fish stocks are at very low levels, sometimes dangerously low, and that can collapse entire food webs um, in our ecosystems. Um, but the converse, farming of fish and shrimp, and particularly shrimp, also has negative side effects. Um, you know, there's a high amount of um, chemicals that are used in shrimp farming that can often run off and pollute nearby water bodies. It can also lead to built toxin levels within the shrimp that you're consuming. And um, all that to say is don't just stop eating fish and shrimp um, because if, if, that's, if that's what you enjoy, that's what you enjoy. But be mindful about where it's coming from, what kind you're buying um, and whether it's in season. And we'll talk about that again in a second. Um, our friend, meat, shows up again, meat and agriculture. Um, uh, cattle farming, as everyone knows, is extremely uh, land intensive. It requires a lot of space, uh, space that could have been used for other habitat, and same with agriculture. And um, obviously, uh, you know, growing things is important to the subsistence of our communities. But growing things to then um, feed to uh, cattle farming and other types of um, uh, meat is uh, obviously problematic because that requires even more land. Um, plastics. Plastics. Uh, I'm sure everyone's heard about plastics and how invasive they are to our environment. Um, they consistently make up, um, in lots of studies, about 80% of all marine debris. 
Um, and there might be now around five, five and a half or just over five trillion uh, macro and microplastics um, floating in the open ocean. And you can't even imagine that number. And the ocean is huge, but that's also a huge number. And there's a lot of species in there being affected by this. The next thing is to think about how you dispose of things. So uh, garburators, enormous strain on the water system. Sometimes your leftover products even enter water bodies. This can lead to algal, algal blooms. Um, and a lot of what we you know, dispose of in general, such as like, and it's not related to garburators, but you know, in, in our fertilizers and in things that we use that can run into water bodies can be really harmful to the water bodies we live near. And Lake Ontario, uh, where I am currently, also suffers from a lot of these um, problems. Plastics, again, <laughs> Plastics don't break down, or if they do, um, it's sometimes even worse. They become microplastics. So again, just be mindful of your plastic consumption. And e-waste. Um, so e-waste is generally pretty recoverable. It's easy-ish to recycle, somewhat, with a caveat. But um, a lot of times our e-waste products don't end up at the places that would most responsibly recycle them. Um, and a lot of recycling plants have hazardous work conditions for the employees who work there. Um, and sometimes they end up at illegal uh, recovery facilities. This is particularly true in Ghana a few years ago. Uh, there were a high number of cases of really, really dangerous e-waste recycling. Uh, and so I have a learn more section on the right side over there. And so this includes um, uh, every tree counts. So uh, I'm a really, <laughs> I'm a really big fan of learning about the environment that you live in. So um, a professor at U of T introduced us to an author, his name is Alan Durning, and he has, he wrote a book called This Place on Earth. And he says in that, that um, he feels that a sense of place is what missing, is, is what is missing from people's lives. And that if we had an anchor, it might turn the efficiency of our industrial society to the ends of enduring longer rather than producing and consuming more. And so he says that a greater rootedness to our environment might be the force that will deter us from eating our habitat alive. And so that's why I have every tree counts in here. You know, learn about the environment you live in. Every tree counts is Toronto's tree guide. Um, most cities have a tree guide. There are loads of resources online, but you know, walk around and learn about the environment that you live in. Um, in Canada, we have Canada's Food Island uh, What's in Season guide, and that will tell you a little bit about, um, you know, what should we eat in season? Because eating in season is far more, it's far better um, from an ecological perspective. And finally, um, and this is uh, a bit more loosely related to ecology and conservation, but extended producer responsibility. So the idea that producers need to be responsible for the stuff they produce and how it's disposed of. Um, and this is relevant because a lot of the plastics that we see that end up in the ocean, no one's like you and you and I aren't doing that intentionally. We're not walking over to, you know, the Atlantic and like throwing something in. It's it's this very, very long supply chain cycle that is somehow getting these plastics to the ocean through various means. And the idea of EPR is to get companies to address that better, is to address the end life of their products. Um, and so read up on EPR, it's a great thing to be um, informed on and I highly, I highly encourage um, uh, uh, reading up on that and I'm really excited to see more activity in this area which is starting to happen. I'm going to move again to the next slide and this is switching gears a little and this is moving away from what we've been talking so far to the more environmental aspects of sustainability um, and how we can make changes in our lives that support these causes because they're often really inextricably linked with environmental issues. Um, for example, we know that waste processing plants use a lot of manual labor, sometimes in hazardous condition. That then becomes a social sustainability issue. Um, and I think millennials and Gen X uh, particularly feel particularly close to this issue because we're the generation, you know, working gig, gig jobs, you know, feeling the effects of precarious employment, you know, on constant contracts, um, feel the ramification of not being able to be paid a living wage, you know, uh, the struggle of owning a home. And so 
Um, even so, we're probably the people on this call might be in the privileged few because it's often our low income workers who are paid extremely low wages. Um, and we're somehow living in a society where this is okay and this exists. So again, you know, watch what you buy and where you buy it. So, um, and these are things you might've heard before. So coffee and chocolate uh, is an extremely um, labor intensive, um, has a very extremely labor intensive supply chain and often in very poor condition, workers work in very poor conditions and don't get paid very much. There was a video recently you might've seen of a um, worker on a cocoa farm being given a Cadbury chocolate bar. And it was the first time he had actually tasted chocolate, which is incredible because he's on a cocoa farm making chocolate, but it's just the discrepancy and the disparity in wealth and development from the start to the end of the supply chain is, is nuts. And so um, you can look for things that are fair trade uh, which have commitments to uh, higher uh, ethical standards, higher environmental standards. Um, meat, our friend meat comes up again. Um, uh, meat uh, production facilities, uh, and I know this particularly in the context of North America, um, have a very, very, one of the highest occupational um, serious instance occurrence rates uh, of many, many industries. Um, they also had very high COVID rates this year because of the working conditions, the cramped working conditions. And it is all around just a very difficult industry for people to work in and sometimes a poorly paid industry. So um, it's another thing that we should be um, careful about and mindful of in our consumption and look for sources that are perhaps uh, less uh, large factory produced. Um, Clothing and fashion, I won't talk about this one for too long, but as we know, um, make wise decisions about your clothing and fashion choices um, because there is, again, intensive and poorly paid labor in these industries. So I'll move on to the where you buy because that's a little more practical in our lives. So um, online retailers, um, there's one particular online retailer that also has the name of a very big forest in Brazil um, that is particularly problematic. You would have seen that there was a move uh, for workers at Amazon to unionize in Alabama earlier this year. Um, and that was because of the really poor working conditions um, as well for those retailers. Um, and also there's other ethical implications. Um, a lot of online, giant online retailers such as Amazon have been known to, um, you know, uh, farm data of the retailers on their platform uh, and then use it, take their product ideas, make them their own and undercut them, sell them at a lower price. That's not great for strong communities. Uh, big, big box stores, some are good, some are better, some are more evil, um, but they also don't deliver that community feel that you want from buying from your local gro grocer. Um, a lot of big box grocery stores have lost the faith of consumers this year in a consumer report that was recently published. Uh, and this is partly due to the poor pandemic pay that was given to them, poor compensation. You know, some workers were given badges saying, congratulations, you know, you're an essential worker, but nothing else. And that's not, that's not good enough. And finally, food delivery. Food delivery is an extremely precarious uh, job to be in. Uh, again, workers usually not very well compensated and um, it's really not a sustainable way for them to be living and for us to be supporting that kind of um, work. Uh, where to learn more, Fair Trade International, lots of great information on Fair Trade. Uh, the CBC did a great uh, article on the human machine, which was on uh, meat farms, uh, meat factory farms, um, which I encourage you to read. It was in the context of COVID as well, so it's quite interesting. And uh, Human Rights Watch has a, a lot of information on different countries and uh, some of the major issues that are occurring in those places, especially around uh, slave labor. Um, and I'll move on, and we only have a few slides left. But um, I think the one question people ask a lot is, am I making a difference? Does individual action really matter? Um, you know, it's great to take your, your grocery bag to the store. You feel great about it. But um, what is it actually doing? So lots of signs point to yes, it is making a difference. 
um, you know, uh, Gen Z and millennials have are far more willing to pay for eco-friendly products. And this has caused a shift in companies actually offering these products and actually being more responsible about their supply chains. Um, COVID-19 lockdowns have improved air quality in cities uh, because people are driving less. Um, shopping has become a political act. Um, again, companies are offering more options. And so yes, individual responsibility is actually essential and a big part of solving the climate crisis. Um, you know, for example, if you, and this is an American statistic, but um, cutting just a quarter of a pound of beef a week, um, which is about one hamburger, um, is the equivalent of taking 10 million cars off the road for a year, which is a lot. Um, by adjusting your thermostat plus or minus two degrees in the summer and winter, you could save um, just under a thousand kilos, uh, just around 2000 pounds of carbon dioxide per year, which is 6% of the average North American's total emissions. Um, and so, you know, there's a number of ways uh, you can live sustainably as, as we've talked about here and, and COVID has really showed the um, impact of that. Um, pollution levels drop 30 to 50%, um, but carbon emissions only drop 4%. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide, which is the converse of what I was just talking about, of am I making a difference? Um, we all know that the top 100 companies probably have the most negative effect on the planet. And um, there's something that we need to do about that. And we've heard that, you know, Gen Z small carbon footprint still might, might not be enough. Um, there are companies that, you know, have, that tell themselves to be super sustainable, have super ethical supply chains. And when we actually test those companies, they don't pass, they don't pass even a basic test of what it, of what a transparent supply chain is. Uh, we hear examples of your cotton tote is not great. I actually disagree with this one. I think if you can take a reusable back to the grocery store, you should. Just don't buy a bunch of cotton bags in order to do this. Take whatever you have at home. Um, there's a great podcast on NPR around how big oil misled the public into believing plastic would be recycled. And there's this whole expose about plastic um, and how it's really not that easy to recycle. And we put it in our recycling bins, but does it really get recycled? Um, I really encourage you to listen to that or, and I think there's an article on it too, so I'll read it. Um, and it took a pandemic to prove individual actions alone won't solve the climate crisis with only a 4% reduction. That's not very much. Um, and in some ways, conscious consumerism is a distraction. Um, the small steps, you know, that we take to recycle, to buy a blouse made of organic cotton or made of hemp, um, don't they change the world in a small way and they create ripple effects that are really important that cause slow change. So if I do it, maybe my friends will do it, maybe their families will do it, but it's a very slow change. Um, and there's a fear that this conscious consumerism can deliver complacency and make us feel like I'm doing everything I can, therefore it must be okay. And the idea of shopping your way to sustainability is also fundamentally flawed because yes, you might be reducing your impact slightly, or you might be, um, or you might be creating more products. But at the end of the day, you're not doing anything regenerative that actually um, uh, takes steps to have a net positive effect on the environment. And I did want to end on a sad note because I do think there's a lot of hope, and I am always heartened by the efforts that people put in. Um, uh, individually and uh, through cumulative action to really um, support climate change efforts and sustainability. And so I, I highlighted six um, little tidbits here that I think are important. Um, so what else can I do? So uh, like we talked about earlier, reduce your consumption and resource use and eat less meat because meat has come up so many times in this conversation and it's kind of crazy. Um, vote, vote with your wallet, um, choose things that you want to support and slowly corporations do respond. They do see what people's choices are and they do move towards that. And it's slow, but it works. Conversely, choose where to not put your money because boycotts really work. 
Um, they maybe they don't, you know, affect a company's bottom line, but the reputational risk to a company is huge. And we've seen a lot of companies in the past change their practices just because of a boycott. Um, um, and sorry, I'm having an internet issue. Okay, it's fixed. Um, so vote and uh, let your political voice be heard. So don't just vote with your wallet, actually go out to the polling boot, uh, booth and vote uh, if you're able to, obviously. Um, you know, follow what's happening in legislation. It might not, you might not be able to impact it. You might just be one, one vote, but if you're informed, you can talk to other people about it and you can change their minds sometimes. And I think that's, that's a really powerful way um, to use your voice. Um, if you're at that time of your life where you're choosing to invest, which by the way, you should start early in life, um, choosing sustainable investments, choosing sustainable investment portfolios, financial institutions in particular have been, have come under more scrutiny and more, and they face more demand to offer more sustainable investment choices. Um, and not investing in uh, climate polluting companies. You know, a lot of people say, well, it doesn't really make a difference because it doesn't affect their operations, but it actually does because a lot of corporate executives have their compensation tied to their shares. And if their share price drops um, because there's low demand for those shares or because there's public pressure or media pressure against it, they're gonna change the way their company works, guaranteed. And we've seen it happen multiple times. Um, and finally, try bringing sustainability to work. Again, this is a shout out to my MSCSM friends. Um, you don't have to work as a climate change activist to bring sustainability into other people's lives. Um, you can do little things. You can start a recycling campaign at work. Um, people get very excited about uh, recycling and it starts a snowball effect of other things that you could do at your company. Um, you know. There's lots of little ways that you can try bringing sustainability ideas and concepts, things around you know corporate responsibility into your everyday work that are really powerful um, and that I highly encourage you to do. Um, and so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I know it was a lot. I know I went very quickly, but um, I encourage you to ask questions now um, because it was just so much content and so little time, but I hope that you picked up snippets here and there that might be helpful to you um, over the course of this last half hour. Wow, Swinzel, thank you for that, um, for sharing your knowledge and those helpful suggestions for living a greener life. I think you did a great job summarizing, you know, all the issues around this multi multifaceted problem, as we all know, and also highlighting a lot of hidden elements that that do make an impact on this issue related to and how retrofits and energy efficiency impact society, as well as thinking about our water footprint. Everyone always thinks about their carbon footprint, but not so much when it comes to water. And that is all very important to, to keep in mind going forward. So we have about 10 minutes left here and we do have quite a few questions coming in from the audience. So I'll just jump right into them. So our first question is from Sunit. So in addition to minimizing our environmental impact, what can we do that is restorative? That's a great question. What can we do that's restorative? Um, it's really hard as an individual. I don't know, Morgan, what do you think? But yeah, it's really hard as an individual because a lot of the stuff we're doing is consuming. Um, there are ways in which you can be restorative, I think, um, if you're you know, doing your own power generation and you can supply it back to the grid, that's a good way. If you have the means to like do a little bit of some subsistence farming in your backyard, that's a really great way. But um, yeah, I don't know if you have any ideas, Morgan. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would jump in and this is all kind of, uh, I, I'm kind of referring back to my experience working for an NGO. Um, back at my time in Hamilton, but uh, on a community level, what, what can be done, a lot of our projects that we did focused on 
planting uh, native uh, native species. And essentially what that helps is just promoting the, um, what is native, I guess the fauna that's native to that environment. And that over, over the term, over many years, leads to a more sustainable and resilient ecosystem. And that also is a better ecosystem for promoting native bees. And we all know how important bees are for our, our food chain, our food supply, and, everything. and it goes down to quite a lot throughout the ecosystem on that. So I can, we have another question here from Dennis. Can you talk a little bit more about the value of solar energy to power your home? Ooh. The value of solar energy to power your home? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a, I'm not a solar or battery expert, but from what I've heard, um, you get a lot of, you get a lot of good rebates in a lot of places from doing solar panels on your home. Um, and the life expectancy of solar panels has significantly increased over time. I think when they first came out, they would last like 10 to 15 years or less. Now I think their life cycle is about 30 to 45 years and the efficiency drop um, is a lot less. I remember uh, at the very start when they first started coming out, you'd see like a 20 to 30% efficiency drop in, in just like 10 years, but now it's like a six to 8% drop in, in 30 years. So I think um, that's as much as I know about solar panels, but I do think they're a really good way um, especially if you live in a region that has like high amounts of sunlight, you have a big roof. Um, yeah, I, I'm all for solar. Um, the, I'm also a fan of microgrid solar. So solar on your house or solar in your neighborhood versus a large solar farm that then has to send the electricity into a larger city. Um, that is a solution, but um, microgrids are a really, really cool way to go. And I'm all for like community driven um, um, interventions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to build on that, just from my work in Natural Resource Canada, a lot of what we do covers renewable energy, including solar. And it, it's definitely going to be a, a very important part of our energy system moving forward. Um, and I would say the way the grid is set up currently, there, there are options and potential for solar panels to uh, be connected back to the grid where consumers who produce their own solar energy can actually send it back to the grid when uh, energy is needed in other places and also get compensation for that. So th th those are potentials for it. And there are also, I guess, other, um, other areas to keep in mind uh, moving forward with solar panels as uh, depending on where you live in Canada, as it's such a big country, um, it's almost helpful to almost have a battery related to connected to your solar panel at times. And there's a huge push around the world right now to uh, obtain a lot of critical minerals and um, mining materials for uh, this push towards battery and moving towards electric uh, for all countries around the world. So. All, all important things to keep in mind on, on the topic of solar, but it, there, there's definitely always good potential there. Yeah, I forgot you're a resident expert on renewables. Yeah, you know, might've done my research paper on it, but no, no biggie. <laughs> um, we have a question from Vince. Can you please expand on your comment about the difference between the terms green and sustainable? Uh, yeah. We so often hear them being used interchangeably and. I, I'm more than happy to add on to your answer. Yeah, symbol. sure. I can start. And I know you, I know you'll have lots to say too. And all of our friends in the chat as well. There's also some really great comments coming in through the chat. Um, but yeah, sustainability um, to me, I know Shahi's on the call. So sustainability is love. Um, but yeah, sustainability is thinking beyond just um, the environment and the and emissions and direct impacts and that, that's I think what people usually associate with green 
Um, sustainability includes social sustainability, um, you know, thriving communities, um, environmental sustainability. And then if we think about it in the business sense, also um, economic sustainability. So maintaining, so if you think about it in the context of a company, they'll want to have a triple bottom line. So that's um, profits, but also um, environmental and social um, um, goals in their in their sustainability because all three of them makes will make the company um, preserve into the future. Um, but yeah, it's sort of a nebulous concept, and a lot of people have their own ideas of it. But I do think it's a more holistic view of um, how we approach um, things related to the environment because they have impacts in other areas too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can add on. Uh, yeah, um, just completely agree with that that point you know green is it, it might resemble it might symbolize as something good for the environment but sustainable is ultimately what we want um, if we want to continue living on earth as an operating as a society um, given you know the demand that we have especially on virgin raw materials for a lot of things for mining energy, and, and forestry, um, it's there's a clear disconnect there in terms of how we plan on meeting uh, future demands, and that is really the core part of getting into sustainability. So uh, there's a question from Madeline, which I, I actually don't have an answer for, and maybe you do, Swinzel. Is there a centralized database that summarizes life cycle assessments? I don't know. Products, no. practices, and their impact. I don't actually know the answer to that question. I know there's like um, people do life cycle assessments on particular industries, but I don't know if there's a database that covers it entirely. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, probably something we can look up after this. For sure, for sure. And I, I believe our time is almost wrapped up here. So. Um, we'll do one last question, and it's from Rodrigo. Um, he is asking, how can consumers be better prepared to recognize and avoid products and companies who use greenwashing to sell their products? The eternal struggle, <laughs> broad. <laughs> um, um, yeah, um, like honestly, the eat like the the way I do it is sometimes I like sit down and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna buy this, and then I end up doing research on it, and then I end up trying to find a report on sustainalytics related to the company, and then I go down a rabbit hole of like looking at other consumer watch sites, and it's exhausting. Like there's just so much. Um, I think the best way you can do it is start small. So maybe like your everyday choices around food or um, things you buy more frequently are places you can start because that's probably where you have the biggest impact versus a one-off purchase. Um, and, then, and then sort of work your way up from there. But there are, um, you could read a company sustainability report, but sometimes it's really hard to get past it. Sometimes it's really hard to see through the greenwashing. But yeah, I found that a really like a like a good place to start. I sometimes like at sustainalytics industry reports and then move on from there. Um, I don't know if you have any other ways, Morgan. Yeah, um, I, I'm sure we're all familiar with the growing trends of companies completing uh, corporate social responsibility and sustainability reports. Um, and it, this is actually a uh, a growing kind of. Uh, area of interest for the government as well in terms of uh, environmental and social governance metrics and how to accurately measure it just because a lot some companies are pushing you know green green marketing and branding doesn't necessarily mean they're doing their part and um, it is it is an area of contention and it's very easy to you know fall trapped in greenwashing at times but um I would say it becomes more and more evident as metrics such as sustainalytics and uh, other selected ESG metrics moving forward um, become more prominent. And and yeah, that's that's all I would have to say on that point. I think uh, with that being said, I think we are uh, out of time. So. Uh, 
Ms. Winslow, I just wanted to say, you know, on behalf of uh, U of T, Mississauga, thank you again for your presentation and your thoughtful answers and to our guest questions. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining and thanks so much, Morgan, for your insights and for moderating. Absolutely. Great. Well, I, I think that wraps up the event. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to welcoming you again at another U of T Mississauga online event. Have a wonderful afternoon.